The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. If this video encourages you, drop a comment and let us know. Our hope is that this message would be a blessing to you today. You can just stay right there just a little bit. Uh, how many of you are looking forward to tonight? That is so good. Um, I do want to. I do want to mention this real quickly, and and uh, and then I'm going to have the worship team come back as well. And uh, but I want to. You, you can go ahead and be seated for a moment, and then let me just share this brief passage. Uh, just these two verses, actually, that I want to share. And it's Hebrews 12, verses one and two. And here's what it says. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, right? Who's the author and finisher of our faith. How many of you are thankful that he's the one who authored our faith? He's the one that helps us finish, right? And then it goes on to say in this second verse, though, who for the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And what I wanted to just share briefly uh, this morning and just give us an opportunity, I really feel like the Lord wants to minister to us in this, but what I wanted to share is this idea of, well, this, that, this part of the verse where it says, that he endured the cross. Well, there was, it was a joy to him, the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And, and there have been times I've touched on during our ministry times and response time, I've touched on shame. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to just spend a little bit more time with that. Because what we see in the scriptures is we see there's a, obviously we see here Jesus and, and the writer of Hebrews saying that Jesus endured the cross and he despised, that means he devalued, he, he brought to nothing the idea of shame, okay? And so, and there's a difference between the work of the Holy Spirit in conviction guys, and shame. So the Holy Spirit convicts us in regards to what we do, what we're doing that's destructive, that's sinful, that's, um, that's dishonoring to the Lord. The Holy Spirit will convict us of those things, right? And when he does, when the Holy Spirit convicts those, it's, it's it's obviously specific. We know what's happening. There's always, and here's the thing about the conviction of the Holy Spirit, is that when the Holy Spirit convicts you and I regarding things in our lives, and we respond to his conviction through repentance, then it's settled. And it's settled. That issue's settled. It says here in Acts, for example, you know, Peter's preaching, and it says, when they heard his sermon, they were cut to the heart. How many of you realize that's conviction? Uh, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do to be saved? <laughs> and then, of course, Peter later on says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission or the destruction of your sins, and it'll be settled, because then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So through the conviction of the Holy Spirit regarding what we do, everybody say what we do. Once we respond to that through repentance, it's settled, that issue settled. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit is, is in regards to what we're doing. The enemy will try to deceive you and I and make us think that shame is from the Holy Spirit. Here's the difference. The Holy Spirit convicts us regarding what we do, and that's good because 
It's specific. We know what it is. We repent. Therefore, we can respond to the Lord. And the promise is when we respond through repentance, the issue is settled. The sins are, that have already been paid for are forgotten. They're assigned someplace. They're assigned to the sea of God's forgetfulness. So that's good, right, everybody? It's good news. Shame, on the other hand, that tries to pass itself off as something from the Lord, it tries to disguise itself as conviction. But the difference is conviction has to do with what we've done or are doing. Shame that comes straight from hell is about who we are. Shame tries to define us. Even after we've repented, and we've re- and it's got and it, now it's settled, right? We just saw that it's settled, right? Shame. The enemy will try to continue to bring shame to you and I, and try to and try to allow us or to allow that shame to define who we are. You are a drug addict. You are an alcoholic. You are lustful. You are an adulterer. You are a fornicator. You are a liar. No, the scripture says, no, that's what you did. And you've repented. And the whole, and, and, the, and it's settled. It's settled. It's forgiven. It's over. But the enemy comes back and tries to convince you and I that that's who we are. And that's not who we are. Matter of fact, Paul told the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, you used to do these things but that's not who you are anymore. He has come to you, you've responded to him, right? The blood of Jesus has cleansed you. That's not who you are, so stop living out of that. Because the conviction of the Holy Spirit sets us free from the authority and the power of sin. Shame perpetuates sin. Because it brings hopelessness, because it's like no matter matter how how much we've repented, we still, we're carrying that identity of that's who I am. And once that's been settled, the truth of the gospel is, is that's what you did, but that's not who you are. So you don't have to live like that. That's what happens. That's how people find, when people begin to live free from their past and free from the sin of the past, it's because they're living out of who they are now, not as a result of the shame of what they were then. Does that make sense, everybody? And there's just a, I mean, there's a lot of situations where the enemy just, and, and I'm telling you, and, we, and many of you know this, you know how heavy and strong and deep and visceral that sense of shame is. I mean, I've experienced it. I remember years ago, it's like I couldn't even, I'd be at, a, at, at lunch with friends and they'd say, Mike, would you pray over the food? And I'm like, I, I, I don't deserve to pray. I'm not worthy to pray. It's after I've repented, after the issue's been settled. Are you following what I'm saying, everybody? That's heavy. It's deep. It's destructive. It's, it's, it's a prison. It's, it's a jail sentence. It's... it's It's suffocating. You can't pray with confidence. You can't experience the joy of your salvation, the truth of the forgiveness of sin and the power of the blood. And the enemy doesn't want us living out of that. He wants us living out of shame because he knows he still has us. Right? And it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. Well, I deserve that. Well, let me help you with that. Yes, you do. I deserve the worst that can happen to me because of what I've done. Let me help you. Absolutely, you do. You do deserve that as far as the, the requirement of heaven, you, re, you deserve that. But the scriptures tell us that we're not saved by what we deserve. We're saved by grace through faith. Amen? And... And it's not a grace, it's not a grace that gives us permission to be sloppy or careless or compromised in our lives. It's the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness, to say no to the devil, right? But at the same time, we all deserve, you know, people say, I want what I deserve. I don't think you do. 
no. <laughs> and that's the beauty of the gospel is that because of what Jesus did on that cross, 1 Corinthians says that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. It's not our righteousness, it's his. He paid the price. Listen, he paid the price for it. He paid the price for it. He paid the penalty, which was death. And then he destroyed the power of death through his resurrection. And so shame can, shame can, can, uh, can come and try to enter through a, a couple of different, two different doors. One is what we've done. And the enemy trying to, live, trying to get us to live within the shadow of our past and, and try to live out of, of the shame of the past. But the first door, or one of those doors that shame comes, walks through, is what we do. We've sinned, we've done wrong, we've disobeyed God, we've dishonored Christ. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for the gift of repentance that we can come and tr truly repent and receive deliverance from that. See, when it says he despised the shame, that means that when Jesus went to the cross, he not only paid the price for our sin, but he did what was necessary to free us and deliver us from the shame of our sin. Right? So the one door that shame will walk through is what we've done. The other door, oftentimes, shame will come is what's been done to us. It's not a sin we've committed. Maybe it's a sin that was committed against us or towards us. It's something that somebody else did to us that we had no control over. We're not responsible for it. And, 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 and the enemy, Satan, is so insidious and so evil that he tries to convince a young girl or a young boy that the abuse that they experienced was somehow their fault and their shame. Aren't you glad that he, for the joy that set before him, he endured the cross and broke and despised the shame? Amen. Does that make sense? So that's the other door that shame comes through. I'm going to, I'll share this and then I want to pray. Um, years ago, I think somewhere in the mid-70s, in Casper, Wyoming, two sisters walked out of a, of a convenience store and um, they were abducted by two men. They drove them to a nearby bridge there in Casper that hung about 120 feet over uh, a river canyon. And the older sister, they beat, brutally beat her and raped her. Somehow she talked them out of doing the same to her younger sister. When they were done with their despicable acts, these two men threw these two girls over the bridge. The younger, the younger sister died immediately on impact. The older sister somehow landed in deeper water, survived the fall, swam to the side, uh, wedged herself between a couple of rocks, until somebody found her and discovered, discovered her and rescued her. And, and shortly thereafter, the two men were arrested. They were tried. They were sent to prison. Fast forward 18 years later, no, I'm sorry, 19 years later, the older sister now is a little two-year-old daughter of her own. And for some reason, she just felt compelled to drive back to the canyon, back to the bridge. 19 years later, she drives back, and her boyfriend's with her. She's sitting on the edge of the bridge, and she begins to retell and relive the story to her boyfriend. And as she's talking, it's like she's reliving it over and over again. And even though she had escaped that canyon physically, she never escaped it in her heart. And she revisited it over and over and over again. And she felt shame. She felt shame because she survived. She felt shame because she couldn't protect her sister. Y'all following me? And so she's sharing this and it becomes just more and more emotional and, and after a while the boyfriend decides, 
this is a little upsetting to the, the, the little two-year-old girl, so he scoops her up in his arms and goes back to the car to put her in the car. And when he does, he hears the splash of shallow water, and he comes back and is horrified to see that the older sister finally surrendered herself to that canyon of the past and was dead on the rocks below as she threw herself over the cliff, over the bridge. And that's something that happened physically. That's something that, you know, was in the news and all of that. But when I read that, I, you know, the thought that came to my mind is that there may not be people that are driving to a physical bridge into a physical canyon, but there are people that live in the canyon of shame and they just can't escape. Maybe it's because of what you've done. And you're, not, and you're just having difficulty receiving His forgiveness and His mercy. Or maybe it's because of something that was done to you. And again, I want to go back to Hebrews 12. For the joy that was set before Him, Jesus Christ carried within Him not only the power, the strength of our sin, but even the sins that were committed against us. And it said not only did he break the authority and the power of sin, but it says he didn't want to leave anything undone because that's how Jesus is. So he endured the cross despising the shame. We're free. He paid not only for our sin, but he paid the price for the shame. Just as you don't have to carry the sin, you don't need to carry the shame. Whether that's something you've done or something that was done to you and the enemy's trying to convince you that you're responsible, it doesn't matter because though that's a lie, the enemy makes the feeling real and the end result is the same, you're still a prisoner. I'm telling you today that because of the cross and the blood of Jesus and that empty tomb, you are not only free from the authority of sin, you are free from the demonic influence of shame over your life. Matter of fact, in the book of Psalms it says, they will look at his face and their faces will not be covered in shame. We are sons and daughters, free, forgiven, healed, whole, set free. Amen. Right? Yeah? I'd like for us to stand. We're going to take a moment and pray. And I know some of you may need to go, and you're, you're welcome to do that at this time. But, but I do believe that the Lord wants to do something here. And I'm going to ask the worship team to just begin to lead us. But I want you to bow your heads, if you would. And, and, um, and, and it's just real simple. I don't want to... This doesn't need to be complicated, guys. I'm going to ask the prayer teams to make their way to the front. For the joy that was set before him. You know why? Even though it was Jesus suffered in his submission to the will of the Father to go to the cross. Listen. It also says, for the joy that was set before him. And that's because it was the compassion of God, it was the love of God, it was the heart of God to set us free. So it's not, this is the end of it for some of you today. After this moment, you're not gonna live another day under the shadow of the shame of the past. It's over, it's done. We're not letting you leave this building without experiencing the freedom and the healing and the mercy of God that's so real to you that you once again experience His joy, the same joy that drove Him to the cross, that same joy strengthens you and is your strength and is the strength of God. We're not letting you leave this room until you are completely set free from the shame of the past. So Father, in the name of Jesus, by your spirit, Holy Spirit, by the power of your love, by your grace and compassion, begin to set your people free. If you need prayer, if you want prayer, if you know, if you, if you sense the Father, if you sense the love of God drawing you now to the front of this room, to this altar, 
to sacrifice the past and the shame and the guilt and the condemnation. Now's the time to do that. You're free. You're free. His love is flowing. The river of his love is flowing. I encourage you to come and make your way down to the front. Let him set you free right now. Let it be a reality to you right now, not just a doctrine, but may it be your life. May you walk away today and say, well, I'll tell you, that thing was on me, but never again, never again, never again will I live under that in the name of Jesus. So just respond now, respond now, respond now. Just be obedient, guys. Lead us right now. Let's worship, let's worship. What a powerful word. We pray that the Holy Spirit ministered to you through this message and empowered you to seek him more and do what he's asking you to do. If you need help taking your next step in your relationship with Christ, we want to help you. Please reach out via social media, our Instagram or our Facebook page. We would love to connect with you.